Welcome to the Power Factor Show. The bandwidth for this episode of the Power Factor Show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv Sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hey Power Factor fans, I'm Rick here at beautiful Renton Fish and Game Club. And I wanted to show uh, one of the advancements that we've made locally. I don't know if it's gonna be anything to, new to you. Uh, when we're setting up our matches, we generally have all of our bits and pieces pulled apart. We have you know two by two uprights. We have pieces that uh, affix things, uh, uprights to the ground. We have these plastic sheets, we have screws. In every match, we essentially custom build the walls that we need. And then after the match, we get out the screw guns and take everything apart and put away the components to be assembled again for the next match. But what we end up doing is essentially assembling the same thing every month. We have these four by eight foot corrugated plastic panels. We screw them onto these uprights, and then at the end of the match, we just take them apart again. And so some of our uh, local guys decided instead of having these uh, take apart and put back together setups, how about if we have a modular system that we can put together in whatever setup we need? And this is just kind of a, a selection of the bits. We have two standard wall panels, which are screwed together on two by two backing. And then we have these uh, concrete bases. We used to have bases that were made out of uh, uh, wood or metal that required that they be staked into the ground um, to actually be able to hold these walls up, you know, if there's any kind of a breeze or anything. So what we have now are these concrete uh, feet with the plastic tubing set into them, and you can arrange these however you want and plug the wall panels into them, and one person can essentially set up a stage uh, in 10 or 15 minutes that maybe three or four or five guys with screw guns and pry bars and stuff would have been able to set up uh, in an hour. And so it's, it's worked out really nice. Uh, hopefully we're gonna have a setup like this for each bay that we can leave in each bay so that when we come in to set up our stages every month, we have a selection of panels we also have uh, panels that will clip on to the edge of this uh, with a binder clip so that if you have, say, a target that is uh, behind the hard cover or soft cover of the wall, you're not shooting up this panel. You can use the binder clip to attach a little wing on the side, put the target behind that, and then the rounds don't chew up your wall, they chew up those wings. We also have some Bianchi barricades that have these same uh, pipes attached to the uprights so that you can plug a wall section in next to the barricade. We have barricades that have ports in them um, so you can you know, make, again, different kinds of configurations utilizing the walls and the barricades in combination. It's just kind of a neat setup. I mean, I don't know if the guys worked from some plans or not. It doesn't look like it would take a lot of you know, brain power to re recreate these, but if you're looking for some uh, type of a setup that's easy to set up that one person can set up. I mean, you can put this panel or this uh, footer down wherever you want, plug one end of the panel into it, and it'll stand up while you go get another foot, plug the other end to it, get another wall, plug that in, and you can just assemble the whole thing very easily. So we're gonna um, use this today uh, in a demonstration and uh, I'm gonna set up a stage and then uh, we'll utilize that in another episode.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Power Factor. Um, this week we're going to take another chapter out of the book, Break Them All, The Complete Guide to Fixing Clay Target Shooting Problems by B.J. McDaniel and Mark Taylor. Uh, if you stick around toward the end of this episode, you'll have a chance to win a copy of this book. Uh, but if you don't feel so lucky, you can actually go to deadtargetschool.com and order one of the books there. Uh, again, I've talked about this book before in the past. I really think this is a, a really valuable uh, tool in, in terms of trying to diagnose uh, shooting, shooting issues. So the chapter today is going to be on optical illusions with target presentations. Um, this is something that you will frequently run into uh, a lot in sporting clays more so than say uh, skeet or trap shooting, which is not to say that you won't run into some optical illusions there. Um, typically the problems that you're going to see in skeet or trap fields are um, let's say slope issues or um, backdrop issues or this, the, the ground, the presentation of the ground or the height of the houses or, or things of that nature. Um, but most of these problems that are discussed in this chapter have to happen more often in sporting clays uh, than in, in skeet and trap. But I would also recommend that um, you keep a lot of this stuff in mind as you go to say your, your skeet or trap field um, and, and look out for these. If you start having problems, it, it may be an optical illusion problem. Um, so let's start out here because there's actually quite a few points here uh, in this chapter of things to consider. And, and when I go through these, these are not to say that you're going to run into these all the time, but if you, if you run into a situation and you're having problems, uh, you may recall this episode, the things that we discussed here, uh, and, and, and possibly some of the solutions that you can apply or at least let's put it this way, things to look out for. Uh, so the first, first example they gave here is a slightly downward sloping hillside. In sporting clays, this may cause a target that follows the line to not look like it's falling. Its height may appear to stay consistent to the distance above the ground, giving the impression that it's tr truly flying horizontal when in reality it's actually dropping. Um, your friends keep telling you that you are shooting high and behind the target. So they give two suggestions here on trying to, to break this sequence. Um, one example they say here first starts with the position of the barrel at the gun ready position, making sure basically that the gun barrel is held below the flight line of the bird. Uh, the second important key they say is seeing and following the target with your eyes. This must be accomplished by focusing on the leading edge of the target and following through as though you are chasing the target to the ground. Now previously we talked about the importance of focusing on the bird, focusing on the leading edge of the bird. Um, and I really didn't take into consideration or take the thought that, that doing that may help you alleviate uh, optical illusion issues. Um, but that's an interesting point here that they're, they're suggest, suggesting that having a, a laser sharp hard focus on the bird may help you uh, deal with, with optical illusions. So a second example here of a optical illusion is an angling target against an irregular background that may appear to hop. Um, when there is a background of different heights or colors uh, composed of different objects, your eyes will judge the target's flight in relationship to the background. As a result, the background texture changes. The perceived position of the target will also seem to change. This perception may cause you to unconsciously move your barrel from are away from the true target flight line. And the solution to this is read the flight path of the target with a straight edge to determine the true flight path without using the background as a reference. And the example that they give here is using the rib of your shotgun, which is hopefully flat, <laughs> um, against the background here to check the actual true flight line of the bird uh, relative to the background. So you can see that it's not hopping and that it's following a true flat trajectory. Uh, so it says that you will now be able to determine the rise and apogee and fall of the, of the flight uh, by first actually seeing that the target does not hop but has a normal flight and by then by developing a plan of attack and focusing on the target's leading edge, you will be able to successfully break the target. So next example here is a target rising alone in the sky. And they give an example here, such as a three meter international trap straight away. I'm not really exactly sure what that is. Um, or a teal target in sporting clays. That I do know what it is. Uh, may actually not be a true straight away, but one that is at a slight angle. 
It also may be curling to one side or the other, and with these high risers, it is difficult to notice when they are no longer straight away, but rather becoming slightly curling targets. With only the sky as a backdrop, you do not have a reference point to judge the trajectory of their flight. And that's really true that I've seen before. When you have a target that's flying against just wide open sky, no clouds, no reference, anything, it's really difficult to actually to determine the line and, and the trajectory of that target because you have no reference points. Um, and I've often noticed in my own shooting that teal targets, ones that are thrown vertical, are a lot easier to pick up in the woods when you have trees and references um, relative to the target versus when the target is thrown wide out in the open and it's just simply going up in the blue sky. Um, and it's, it's very interesting in that a lot of times targets that are thrown, you may just simply read them as a pure vertical target when in reality they're either being thrown slightly flat away from you or as they go up they'll hook one way to the right or to the left. Um, so it's, it's interesting to look for situations like that and be able to try to you know, deal with it. Um, the solution here is in sporting clay, sorry, in the sporting example, after previewing the target and noticing when the curl begins, the shooter needs to set up a shoot, I'm sorry, set, a, set up to shoot the target in one of its two most linear points, going up or coming down straight away uh, from the curl, curl. In the trap example, following on the leading edge of the target before committing the gun to the target will give the shooter a better read on the real trajectory of the target. As with all straightaways in international trap, make sure you see it before you move the gun. That actually is true, I think, in, in just general in shooting. You want to make sure that you always see the target before moving the gun to the target because if you don't see the target properly and you move the gun early, you'll end up moving the gun to the wrong flight line, long, wrong trajectory line of the target. In terms of teal targets, what I've noticed recently in shooting teal is that I was always try to shoot teal at the peak. You're always thinking, well, when, when the target gets to the peak and it stops, this will be the easiest spot to shoot it. Tried that numerous times, didn't work so well. And the reason I think it doesn't work so well is that when you are literally watching that target going up and following it, you're, you have all the time in the world to try to place that shot at the top. And that's the problem is that you are trying to time it of placing the shot at the top. You end up becoming a little bit too much burr barrel wear and literally to the point of maybe aiming. What I found that works out really well is you simply just, as the bird's coming up, you pick your break point and you move the gun to that break point. You let your subconscious commit the shot and it ends up being a lot more successful. So it kind of gets into what we were discussing be before and the episode on breaking down the shot and break points of a early break point, a sweet spot, and a late break point. An early break point might be on the rise. Um, a sweet spot, however, might be argued would be somewhere around the top, and then a late break point would be at the fall. You want to be able to hit a target at all those spots. Now, in terms of hitting a target at the top, at least in, in the teal, I found a lot of times is that when it's a second target of a pair, and I break something else and that other target's right up there, I literally snap to it and go right to it at the peak, I don't have any trouble. The problem for me is when I'm trying to time that shot at the peak, I end up basically riding the bird, aiming, so to speak, um, trying to time it, and it, it doesn't work. So just a little personal tip there. Um, next example is a target streaking across a line of pine trees with bare trunks that may appear to have a strobe-like effect on your eyes. Your eyes actually are moving objects, I'm sorry, your eyes actually are see moving objects in a strobe-like manner called, and this is a French word, saccade, I believe. As you watch a moving target flight, you are really seeing a string of individual pictures. Your brain takes these pictures and basically fills in the gaps between the pictures so that the target appears to be in a smooth flight. Uh, when you place the target flight against pole-like trees, the strobe effect increases and can require that your brain work even harder. I've noticed this um, before in the woods with trees um, and lighting where you will get a strobe effect as the bird uh, moves either through uh, light spot to dark spot or lit areas to shadows. I've also noticed it, um, and John will probably laugh about this, but in shooting ski at Renton where we frequently shoot during uh, the latter part of the year when the, the sun is very uh, low in the horizon shining through the trees, you'll get some really vicious shadows in the skeet field 
where you'll literally have shadow light, shadow light, shadow light as the bird goes across and, and it's very easy to lose the bird as it's going across uh, in ski when it's doing that. It's really tough to see it. Uh, their recommendation for dealing with this is just choose a lens color that washes out the color of the trees and optimizes the color of the target. As you minimize or blend in the background, the strobe effect decreases. Your mental and visual focus must be on the target. It makes it easier for the brain to fill in the gaps between the pictures, thus producing a clearer image with little strobe effect. Uh, that's it's a really interesting point in terms of lens color, and we have not really talked about lens color uh, much in the past, and, and maybe that's a hint that we should do an episode on that sometime in the future. But but it's really amazing that you can change lens color, and the popular colors usually are like a yellow for um, for cloudy conditions. Um, usually a red uh, for brighter conditions, and then sometimes either a bronze or a purple. Um, and I've seen that purple really accentuates targets, uh, especially against green backgrounds and things like that. So, so oftentimes, you know, play around with the lens color uh, and, and see what works for you given the, the shooting conditions that you're in. Uh, so the next example here of an optical illusion is a target passing through large shadows that may seem to be that may seem to be slowing as the surface of the target goes from light to dark and perhaps back to light again the reflected light produ per sorry per produced by your eyes gives little uh, sorry the reflected light is processed by your eyes a little differently the target may appear to lope across the field at uneven speeds, and then as it comes out of the shadow, it may appear to jump ahead uh, with more speed. As it goes into shadow, it may appear to slow down, causing you to shoot uh, at the target instead of the proper lead. It is the transition points that cause the illusion, not the actual time in or out of the shadow. Uh, I've noticed this also before in that as a target transitions across the field and goes into an out of light conditions, it does appear to jump. It seems like it, as it's coming out of the dark or shadow into the light, it, it, seems, like, it seems like it accelerates and yet it doesn't. Um, and as it goes from light into dark, it seems like it decelerates and again, it doesn't. Uh, so the solution to this is become aware of these targets. Plan your setup shot to take the target in the middle or end portion of the shadow or the sunlit areas. Avoid shooting the targets as they transition uh, between the two. So that's a key point there is that don't set up your break point to be right the transition between a light to dark or dark to light. Again, this gets into becoming um, more comfortable with late break point or early break point so that you can time your shot into one of these spots rather than let's say the sweet, what you normally define as a sweet spot as a transition point, you need to be able to take this, this target um, either late or early. So another example here is a downward slope in front of a trap house or ski field. Okay, so this is where it gets into trap and ski. Um, a downward slope will make the target appear to be higher or rising more than it is. This happens be because you tend to use the ground as a reference point to judge both the height and whether the flight path is level. The visual clues may cause you to hold your gun in an incorrect ready position, making your move to the target different, shorter or longer than normal. You may also drive the gun through the target too quickly, thinking that the target is rising as a result shoot over the target. So the solution to this is be on the lookout for shooting fields built like this. Then use only the trap house or the skeet house window when setting up your hold point in the ready position. In other words, you want to find a hard reference point rather than more often than not what a lot of times people do is they'll pick something in the distance. In trap, they always tell you, you know, look at something well off in the distance so your eyes are, are far and the ship is from far to near as opposed to near to far. Or in skeet, they'll say, you know, pick something just outside of the trap house, a tree, the hill, a branch, or something or other, and use that as your reference point. So what they're suggesting here in a situation where you have an uneven field is now to set up more off of a known reference point, such as the trap house or the skeet um, house itself. Uh, so it says here, learn to judge by measuring, if necessary, the actual height of the targets with relation to the trap house and not the ground level. Uh, by doing some measurements, you will reaffirm your, in your mind the correct position and flight of these targets and will not be fooled by incorrect actions. It says here, on certain skeet fields, you may feel that the target is quicker and gets across the field before you can respond. This may be because you are lazy on how you look for the target, not saying that you're lazy, um, only seeing when it crosses, 
crosses the outer edge of the house. Two things can contribute to this. First, because all skeet fields, skeet houses are different, the actual distance from the edge of the window to the edge of the house on one range may be longer or shorter than another one. In that circumstance, you may be waiting for the target to clear the edge of the house and it will get a slight jump on you. Second, if the face of the house, the skeet house, is a shadow, the target will be harder to see and you might pick up its movement later. Uh, it says here the key to this is to be looking for the target movement at the outer edge of the window, not the house. We talked about that before about visual pickup points or, or look points and that you don't want to, in particular the case of skeet, you don't want to look in the house um, because what happens is that the target will come out as a blur and you won't catch, you won't lack, lock onto it. Uh, it says usually the skeet window opening is painted a contrasting color that will allow you to see the movement. Also, if the house face is in a shadow, make sure that the tint of your glasses is light enough to clearly see the target's movement against the shadow, but not so light that it's causing squinting. So next, next example here of an illusion is some targets seem to glow, making them look like a fuzzy spot moving across the sky instead of a well-defined target. Again, going back to discussions previously about focusing on the target, not focusing on the hole or having hole, hole target, not hole, um, or having a soft focus or a global focus. You wanna have a, a laser sharp pinpoint uh, spot specific focus on the target. Uh, so it says against light color backgrounds like the sky, targets will lose contract, contrast and therefore edge definition. This is especially true with bright solid color targets like biodegradable targets or with flash or powder filled targets which you typically don't see. Uh, under these conditions, at least I don't see them, under these conditions the streak you see causes your eye to trail the target and therefore you end up looking at the back of the target and consequently you end up breaking the back edge of the bird or missing it from behind. Uh, ultimately, your gun barrel is not moved in control with the proper lead and the target is missed. So the solution to this it says the best approach to solve this issue is to choose the correct color and tint of shooting glasses. Have several different lenses on hand to select the best lenses to enhance the target and soften the background to any light conditions. Lens colors can be used to provide different target definition against backgrounds and reduce the fuzzy appearance of targets. Um, they suggest here getting polarized lenses to reduce glare. It says the idea is to select the right color with the lightest possible tint with, that can be worn without squinting. Uh, interesting point here, it says when you reach the age of 35 years of age and older, and I'm well beyond that, you will typically need to go to lighter tinted lenses to make sure you can see the target against dark backgrounds and shadows. That's an interesting point there. I've noticed even recently on fairly bright days that I've been perfectly comfortable wearing my, my yellow lens tint uh, lenses uh, for shooting. Um, I don't know why, but it just seems um, a lot more comfortable wearing those. I'm not in an in a overload light situation or squint condition or anything like that. but but for whatever reason, maybe personal, may just be my eyes, I don't know what, um, but the yellows have been working out really well versus my red uh, lenses that I've used before in the past. Uh, next example here, this is kind of interesting. In sporting clays, target diameters range from 110 millimeters to 60 millimeters. Um, it says, although a 60 millimeter target is not hard to spot, a 90 millimeter target is sometimes difficult to tell from a, a standard 110 millimeter target. A 90 millimeter target, by the way, is called a midi. Uh, if you think a 90 millimeter, tar 90 millimeter is a standard 110 millimeter target, you'll be fooled into thinking that it's further away than it really is, or that it's going faster than it really is. In reality, it goes about the same speed uh, as a 110 millimeter target, but because of the fact that it's smaller, it's an optical illusion that you, it, it appears that it's further out there. It also appears that it's moving faster. And because of the fact that it appears that it's moving faster or that it's further out, you'll misread it thinking that it takes more lead than in reality it, it really does. Uh, and as strange as it seems, you actually miss in front because you're, you're overleading the target. Um, the optical illusion be occurs because of the way you estimate the speed of flying objects. This part's really interesting. For example, most jets land at speeds between 170 and 190 knots. Yet big jets look as if they're hardly moving and little ones zip right in and seem to go much faster. Why? It has to do with their speed as compared to their length. 
Your eyes seem to tell you when the plane has moved its length, which you translate into apparent speed, because a short, small plane travels its length quicker than a longer, larger plane. Both are flying at the same speed, and yet the small plane looks faster. The same thing applies to targets of different sizes. So how do we deal with this? It says the easiest way to ask, and that's a very good, important point. Um, ask the polar what targets are being used in the shooting stand. Um, he will tell you. Next, observe both the target launch point and the target landing area. This will help you estimate how far the target is flying and the distance from the shooter. If a 90 millimeter target is traveling 45 to 60 yards, it's no big deal. Well, 60 yards for me probably would be a big deal, but yeah, that's just me. Um, that's only as far as some trap or ski targets. Uh, however, if it's going 60 yards plus and it has substantial speed on it and your lead must be adjusting accordingly. So they go through the usual thing here of how do I know if I'm doing it, how do I stop doing it, and how to prevent uh, from happening again. And the point they make here is that if you're consistently missing the same target presentation but don't know why, there's a very good chance that it may have something to do with an optical illusion. Also, if other shooters are having issues with a uh, particular presentation over and over and it's multiple shooters, that may be a clue that there's an optical illusion going on. I've mentioned this before. Um, an example of this in the Breaking Down the Shot uh, episode where I talked about a presentation where there was a hill and the targets were thrown from your left, apparent, apparently, apparently going flat uh, or going up the hill. They looked like they were rising, but in reality they were flat and, and actually dropping and curling to the right. And people were missing this target over and over and over, high and behind. And it wasn't enabled until Dave took basically a, a shot shell box, knocked out the top and bottom, held it up, watched the target go through it. You could see that it was literally coming in from the left-hand upper edge and dropping out through the lower right-hand corner. And you could then tell that it was really a curling, dropping target. And it really required a compound lead of putting the shot, you know, I'm going to say probably down at the 4 or maybe 5 o'clock position, well down in front, as opposed to what people were trying to do of, of reading it as a flat target. So if you're seeing other people have problems with targets and they're doing this over and over, um, there's a very good chance that there is an optical illusion going on. Also, if you're having problems with a target and you're missing over and over, change something. Don't just sit there and keep doing the same thing. Try to read the bird. Try to you know see what the background looks like, but change something um, because if you keep doing the same thing over and over, I think that's the definition of insanity. Um, it's, you know, if you miss the first time, chances are if you do nothing, you're going to miss it the exact same way, and you do the same thing. Um, when I say you do nothing, you do nothing to correct it. You do the same thing you did before, you're probably going to miss it again, unless you somehow just happen to get lucky. So, trivia question. Uh, to win a copy of this book, um, the trivia question is, Name the five different uh, steps to um, what I talked about before, which was visual exercises. Uh, so if you go to deadtargetschool.com on there, there is a segment on the different shooting exercises, and there are five of them. So it'll list all the five different shooting exercises. And again, uh, send your answers in to powerfactorshow at gmail.com. Don't do it on YouTube or Facebook because then you're just giving your answers away to everybody else. I'm sure they'd appreciate it, um, but you may not because it just decreases your chances of winning. Um, so again, get your answers in, get them in in a week. Um, we'll pick uh, from the correct answers, we'll pick a name and get the book out to you. So again, thanks to Mark for, uh, for donating uh, some of the books to the program, really do appreciate it. Uh, again, if you want to get your own copy of the book, uh, deadtargetschool.com, you can order it from them. I think really think, really think it's a valuable investment because there's a lot of uh, of good stuff that's covered in here. Um, you'll note today, it's kind of like a reoccurring theme throughout the book, but they keep focusing on it. Um, I'm sorry to use focus as a, a pun there, but focus, and it's interesting in this chapter here, focus in the bird seems to come up quite frequently and, and lens uh, color selection is coming up frequently. So two very val val valuable points there to, uh, to consider in your shooting. So thanks, and we will see you next time. Bum, bum, bum.